Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, this is lesson number two in that series, is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. And this lesson is entitled, The Origin and Nature of the Bible. It's the lesson for April 11 of 2020. The origin and nature of the Bible. Well, that'll be an interesting question, an interesting subject. As usual, though, we would like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we recognize your presence among us, and we are so thankful for the guidance you provide us as we study your word. Where would we be without your word? We would just be totally lost. How could we possibly have any idea what's right, what's wrong, where to go, where to find anything? But here we have it all in one book that needs to be read and reread and reread and reread. And we thank you for it so much. Help us now as we study through this series of lessons to take your word seriously as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So how should we approach this book? Is it like any other book? No. no, inspired scripture is different from any other kind of literature. Just as scientists need to receive special training to understand and experiment in their chosen field, Bible-believing Christians need to approach the Bible with an attitude of faith. Approaching the Bible in a skeptical manner with doubts immediately suggests that one is choosing to judge the scriptures rather than allowing the scriptures to instruct him or her. So what do we know about the divine inspiration or divine revelation of the Bible? Dennis? From 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will uh, do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. That's uh, the Good News translation. Okay. So what uh, we, we need to, in this series, we need to, pick apart some of these verses. We're not going to choose a huge, big, long passages. We're going to pick a few verses here and there, and that means we, we need to really try to nail down what we think they tell us. What does it actually mean to say that prophets and apostles were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote? What do you think that actually means? Does God pick them up by the nape of the neck and say, over here, sit down, I want to say something to you? Kind of did that to Jonah. Yeah. Well, and John, you know, he yeah. had the the Lord appeared to him suddenly uh, on the Sabbath, and and he kept telling him, "Write this down. Write this down." Mm -hmm. Except for one part, said, "Don't write this down." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Ezekiel talks about a time being picked up and carried over to see what was in vision, anyway, to see what was going on in the temple, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. In that case, if they were moved by the Holy Spirit, who was the actual author? God. Oh, it had to be God. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. God. We, well, it depends on whether you think the words that, themselves, see. Uh, one parallel might be the, when Jesus uh, and the disciples were going through Samaria and they were rebuked by the Samaritans and the disciples wanted to call down fire mm -hmm. uh, and consume them. And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you were of for the Son of Man did not come to destroy life, but to save it. Now they could say, well, I've got a text for it right here. You know, I could, uh, mm -hmm. that was done by uh, Elijah. So why can't we do that? Um, but it was the spirit that they were of. The spirit was not driving their actions in that place that particular situation. So unless the Spirit is driving us uh, to write or to speak about something, 
uh, it just comes from, it more often comes from a very bad place. Okay, so. Uh, cause and effect. You're, you're, you're sleeping. Yeah, the writing is the effect. The cause is, is the spirit that comes and acts on the mind. You're sleeping in your bed one night and all of a sudden you have what you think is a kind of dream, but it's quite vivid and very, you wake up and whoa, where did that come from? And you say, if you're one of these prophets, what do you say? God told me or God showed me. Mm -hmm. And your friends say, ah, you just had a bad dream. Or a good dream. Or a good dream. Or you're crazy. Or you're crazy. Or, or you ate too a, much dinner before you went to bed. Yes. Or took a hallucinogen. Too late. There it is. <laughs> so how would you decide? Could God come and appear to one of us? And how would we decide whether this is from God or this is from a different source? By their fruit you shall know them. Yeah. Oh, one yeah. of those kind of tricks, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, God worked in various ways to give visions we know dreams we know, even lived out parables to illustrate the truths he was trying to teach. Margaret? This is from 2 Peter 1.16. We have not depended on man-made up, made up stories in making known to you the mighty coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. Wow. And this is from the Good News Bible. Okay. So he's relaying what he saw. Okay, if we refuse to accept the idea that God is behind the writing of the Bible, then the Bible will be of very little use to us. Now, does that mean we have to have faith first and then we need to read the Bible? Or do we read the Bible to get faith? We are given a measure of faith. So the Bible gives an opportunity for us, for that faith to grow from faith to faith, as Paul says in Romans mm -hmm. 1. But don't you think our desire to read Scripture really comes from the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the way you, you, your attitude toward when you're reading the Bible, if you're receptive to God's Spirit or, or if you're looking for mistakes and looking yeah. for, you know, your attitude and, and how you approach it. So how do we explain the fact that many people have been completely changed by reading even a portion of scripture. I grew up in a, one of the northern states in this country by the name of Idaho, and it was famous because a criminal uh, planted a bomb in the, in the uh, governor's mailbox and it killed him. Harry Orchard. Yeah, and he, he, he went to jail, and there in jail, he had people come and start talking to him. And his life was completely transformed. Wasn't that the governor's wife that came to, to visit him? And well, she was a yeah, civil Yeah, it was actually. Yeah. And he, and he never left the place. Yeah. He, they had a sh little house or shack or whatever the, on, the, on the prison grounds, according to the story goes. Uh, and he's, yeah. he died there. He could apparently uh, so who was let him go. So who was around telling that story when I was a kid at Walla Walla College? We oh, heard somebody was involved book, uh, in it. was a book called yeah, Harry Orchard. Yeah. yeah, but somebody was there that was there telling the Probably. story. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is just one example. There are many, many examples like this of people who are transformed by hearing and learning about the Bible. Many years ago, about probably 25 years ago, uh, in the quarterly or the Bible study guide has little uh, snippets or uh, mm -hmm. pages about di different people's experiences. Mm -hmm. And what struck me years ago was about a fellow from Nigeria that was uh, raised a Muslim and he hated Christianity, but somehow somebody got him to, or he decided to read the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. And he has his testimony there, but it just a 180 degree uh, yeah. change. It was really, I was impressed with it anyway. Yeah. When we say that God is the ultimate author, that is the reason we call this book of 66 smaller books the Holy Scriptures. What does that mean? Holy means what? The word holy means? Sorry. Comes from a word which means to be set aside, to be unique, to be different. The scriptures is just writings. Yeah, exactly. Do we need more help than just a printed book? 
The Holy Spirit who inspired these writings also is available to us today to help us to interpret and to understand what has been written. One thing, you know, as I remember, you go through the Old Testament and God says, you don't listen, you don't listen, you don't listen. He didn't say, you're not reading enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, so the, the, what we have is a, a conscience. It's there's something God has been able to communicate to people, but you, if you turn it off or constantly reject it, he will honor your choice. Of, yeah, it's fun to read the Bible that way. One year I went through the whole Bible, and every time it said pay attention or what meant listen, I underlined that in orange. Mm -hmm. It was kind of fun yeah. to look for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and you go a little farther in the, in the chapter, for example, of the prophets, and he says, you don't listen, but I'll heal you. I'll restore you, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, which means save or salvation. So how can we be sure that we are interpreting the scriptures according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and not just some personal opinion? These are, these are challenging questions. I, we can't sort of just flippantly answer just like that. I understand that, but Well, yes. Paul says, uh, uh, let the prophets speak one at a time and let the others pass judgment. So there's, there's a bit of a community uh, mm -hmm. effort in this because we all know in part, we prophesy in part, we don't, we don't have everything. So mm -hmm. we have to submit ourselves one to another so that we can learn from from others. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you think God uh, chooses what he wants to reveal? He just, I mean, if you just l laid out what the, the revelations that we know about, they could seem very arbitrary. Oh, I'll get, I guess I'll do something over here. I'll do something there and something there and well, something here. Well, in, ed in education, uh, page 81, she says, he, that is Jesus, said nothing to gratify the curiosity or to stimulate selfish ambition. Mm -hmm. He did not deal in abstract theories, but in that which is essential to the development of character, which will, which will enlarge the man, uh, large man's capacity for knowing God and increase his power to do good. He spoke of those uh, truths that relate to the conduct of life and that unite man with eternity. So okay. that, I think, sort of encapsulates what he was mm -hmm. trying to get at rather than dazzle us with this piece of information so or another. The, the Bible is not just, as, as I probably thought when I was younger, the Bible is not just a book about do's and don'ts or deeds to be done and sins to be shunned. It tells God's story in the context of human lives. But sometimes it seems hard to obey and do what God asks us to do. Think of Jonah. Mm -hmm. Did you think it was easy to go to Nineveh? <clears throat> Not at all. At times, do you find it difficult to believe and obey what the Bible says? You don't have to answer that openly. Do you, find, do you have trouble interpreting some of the sections of the Bible? God claims that what is written in the 66 books of the Bible from Genesis 1-1 right through Revelation 22-21 was written under his inspiration. Now we need to mention, and we'll talk more about this I'm sure in the future, Roman Catholics want to add 14 extra books. How should we relate to those? The Orthodox add some extra materials that we don't include in our Bibles. What should we do with those passages? And Martin Luther wanted to exclude four or five books. Yes, exactly. So, uh, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about how does God communicate? Mm -hmm. And is it, of course, we had last week we did this Amos 3 7. Okay. But another word, th th this idea of secret, but another way of saying you could say his counsel, um, uh, his uh, familiar converse, his intimacy. It, it, it doesn't do anything without revealing the secrets. Well, li, re, replace that secret because it's not a secret if, if God has made it known. Uh -huh. So it, yeah. it's... it's uh, okay. <clears throat> Who's next here? Let's see. Second Peter one twenty one. That says, For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. That's the Good News Bible. And then in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, I will send them a prophet like you from among their people. 
I will tell him what to say, and he will tell the people everything I command. So now I have to question, ask a question about that. Who do we think he was telling Moses about? Someone is going to come in the future. Who do you think that was? Jesus. 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 We Christians almost universally say this is a prophecy about Jesus. So what does this tell us about the relationship between the Father and Jesus when Jesus is here on this earth? I will tell him what to say. He will tell the people everything I command. Is that what happened when Jesus was here? It's what Jesus said happened. I do nothing except what I see the Father doing, and uh, I don't speak of my own initiative, but I wow. uh, say what he said. So, so when people w say, well, Jesus was just a, a child of his time, you know, mm. about certain things, um, they're approaching in a very, nat you know, we could get into that, naturalistic, we could get a whole thing on that. But they're basically saying that God, the Father, wouldn't have known this, that, or mm -hmm. the other. We don't have to bring up the specifics right now. But We need, and this is important, to carefully separate in our minds what is inspiring and what is inspired. Some, characteristic, some charismatic, I'm sorry, speakers may move us to do all kinds of things. We might call them inspiring. But that does not make them inspired, as if what they spoke is from God. God has used many different ways of revealing the truth to his inspired authors. Joshua 10.13 tells us that Joshua quoted from the book of Jasher. Now, have you all read Jasher recently? No, never. <laughs> it's quoted in several parts of the Bible, two, three places. They must have had it then. Yeah, and look at Luke 1, 1 to 3, where Luke tells us how he gathered information from those who were eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. I suspect that when Paul was in prison at Caesarea Maritima for about over two years, that Luke, who came to Palestine with him, probably went around and said, you, what did you know about Jesus? Did you, did you see him? What did you see? What did you see? What did you see? And that's why he has a fairly comprehensive history of the life of Jesus. So, how do we define the word scripture? We need to be a bit cautious about calling all of scripture inspired. In the original language, the word scripture meant anything that had been written down. It is only the divinely inspired scripture that comes from God and is truly profitable. At the time that uh, Paul wrote that, uh, there was a lot of the, uh, the, uh, what, the Gnostic Gospels yeah. and all that stuff was floating around, so... It was the inspired things that's profitable, mm -hmm. or the writings that are inspired by God. Gordon? Romans 15, 4. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through the patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. And then from Ellen White in the introduction to the Great Controversy, the Bible points to God as its author. Yet it was written by human hands, and in the varied style of its different books, it presents the characteristics of the several writers. The truths revealed are all, quote, given by inspiration of God, end quote, yet they are expressed in the words of men. Okay, so we're starting to get the idea. So what God is trying to tell us here is that there was some kind of a partnership going on, right? Today, those who, there are those who call themselves biblical scholars, but who deny the accounts of creation. I have been listening to a short series um, in, on YouTube where there is one skeptic and one Bible-believing Christian, and they're talking about how you should relate to, to the Bible and, and the translations of the Bible. It's very interesting uh, if you have some time. Have a look at it sometime. Um, these so-called Bible scholars doubt the, the accounts of creation. They doubt the accounts of the Exodus. They doubt even the resurrection of Jesus. So why would, why would they do that? What do they have left? I mean, there's, if, if you don't have the resurrection of Jesus, there's nothing left. Yeah. And, and 
can't, yeah, exactly. Well, it's I mean, a natural, naturalistic interpretation, mm -hmm. which is part of what, uh, for instance, the historical critical method is. It's mm -hmm. developed to examine ancient texts, mm -hmm. but if you try to, and then it says, well, you, they can't understand it, only what the person of the time could have understood mm -hmm. is acceptable, and there's no predicting the future. It's all pretty much takes away uh, God out of the, the picture. Yeah, It can be helpful to kind of weed out some of the human elements of Scripture, but it can obliterate or, or um, cover up some of the, thing, the divine elements of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of evidence do you think is most convincing? Let's look at three possibilities. Is it the internal consistency of the Bible itself? Is it the findings of archaeology which support the Bible? Is it the interpretations of biblical scholars that have impressed you? Well, I think we talked about it last week with changed lives. It, it changes, it has power uh, to change lives because people are going to argue over these different points in the yeah. Bible. And they will find things, if they develop a critical fault-finding spirit, they'll find things um, errors where no errors really exist. Mm -hmm. Well, Moses was the earliest uh, author. To yeah. answer your question mm -hmm. about which of the th those three things listed, I don't think it's just one. Mm -hmm. It's all of the above and more. Right, exactly. Well, Moses was the earliest author of some of the Bible, parts of the Bible. He, and when he first started working there, when he down in Egypt, I'm sure he learned this used one of the very first alphabetical forms of writing. If you've had any exposure at all to the earlier types of writing, the cuneiform and the hieroglyphics, you almost have to have a, some kind of imagination to interpret those, those, those. It's not clear. But now Moses started writing, and what does he use? He uses an alphabetical kind of language so that we know, there's no question about the letters, and I mean, assuming we can read them, and so forth and so forth. That makes a big difference in our understanding. Um, made the passages more precise than earlier methods of writing, like the cuneiform and the hieroglyphics. So writing is more explicit than a picture mm -hmm. of something. Yeah, also true. So in Exodus 17 and 24, and Joshua 24, and Jeremiah 30, Revelation, one in many places, repeatedly we see in these verses that God told his faithful servants to carefully write down what he had told them. So I, I try to imagine in my mind, I close my eyes and I say, okay, here I see an, a, a vision has been given to this person. How is he going to write it down? I... Obviously, it's way beyond it. I have a son-in-law who's an excellent artist. And he can just sit down there and shh, 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 this is a beautiful picture. I can't even... <laughs> if someone says, here's a picture, write it down, I could say, well, there's a man on the road, or, you know, <laughs> I could say something like that, but that's, that's about where it ends. I just don't... Yeah. I don't have that capacity. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. Why is the written word such an important part of our religious lives? Well, it's good because we can always come back to that as a reference point from which we can determine whether what we're, look at, what we're seeing and what we're thinking is correct. It can be made available to many people and can be translated and reproduced in many languages. It has proven to be a massive blessing to even generations, to even generations later like us. And I'm sure you've seen this before and people... I probably got tired of saying it, so they, we don't hear it quite so much anymore, but there's no other book in the, in the history of our world that comes even close to the number, of, uh, to the number that, uh, that have been printed, like the Bible, or portions of the Bible. Millions and millions and millions uh, of copies. One of the interesting pictures we see in Scripture is the similarities between Christ 
and Scripture. Okay, John? Gary. Yeah, Gary, I mean, it's we'll reading from John. We'll start with John 1, verse 14. The Word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. Comes from the Good News Bible. We move on to John 2.22. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. Again from the Good News Bible. John 8.31-32. to So Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Good News Bible again. John 17, verse 17. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. Good News Bible. So, Jesus and the Scripture are similar in many ways. Jesus was supernaturally conceived by the Holy Spirit, but was yet born of a woman. Scriptures as we have them were of supernatural origin, but were delivered through the human being, delivered through human beings as well. Jesus became a man in time and space. He lived in a certain place in a certain time. That did not nullify his divinity. The scriptures were given in a certain context, in a certain culture, and in a certain language. But their impact has been worldwide and ongoing. So just a real quick Quiz question, how many different languages was the Bible written in? At least three. Yeah. Three. Greek, Hebrew. Yeah. Greek Aramaic. and Hebrew and some small portions in Aramaic. Aramaic yeah. There is still about 5% of the world's population that does not have any portion of the Bible available to them in a language that they can easily read and understand. Do we need to do something to correct that problem? Wycliffe Bible Translators have been working on that for yeah. many years. Yeah, still are. And doing a bit more, better and better job all the time. You wonder, do they have a way of writing? I mean, some of these yeah. the people, do they, have, do they have an alphabet? Do they have a way of yeah. writing? Do they? If you read the, the books that come out of Wycliffe Bible Translators that Jim just mentioned, yeah, there, there are places where they go and try to, they want to reproduce the Bible in their language, they have to invent an alphabet yeah. for them. And there's dialects from languages. They're just like roots under a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Jesus came down and made himself a part of the human family. He accepted humanity after about 4,000 plus years of degeneracy. In the same way, the Bible is not given in some perfect superhuman language that no one is able to speak or understand. While human language always has its limitations, God still uses it to communicate his will to human beings. No language is perfect, and no language can be perfectly translated into any other language. But we need to, and I can tell you, for someone like myself who always works back and forth between two different languages, in our case it's Spanish and English, you know you can't. It's just completely impossible to completely carry all the meaning from one language into another language. You, the words over here will mean a little bit different than what they did over there and so forth. But we need to do our best to accommodate our thinking to these limitations and still see God's overarching message through it all. So what do we need to do? We need to get enough familiar with the writings and enough familiar with the context in which the Bible is written so that we can say, oh yes, I, I, I can see how that could take place in that setting. While there are interesting similarities between the Bible and Jesus, the Bible is not an incarnation of God. Jesus is not a book. We respect and love the Bible because of the person it reveals to us. Jim? The Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus it is true of the Bible, as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John 
1.14. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 4. Okay, human authors may produce written materials that are impressive and inspiring, but that does not make them equal to the Bible. Hebrews 11, 3 and 6. I'm going to look at especially at verse 6. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek him. So is that one of the ways we develop faith? Come to God? Believe that he's active? The willingness to listen and take instruction. Mm -hmm. Isn't that about the minimum requirement for... Why is faith necessary in understanding and appreciating Scripture? What does faith have to do with believing that God exists and that he will someday reward those who seek him? To get an answer to that, we must remember that. And now I'm going to read you a definition of faith that was put together originally by my favorite mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. This is not some ethereal, you know, completely impossible to explain thing. No, this is the way the human mind works. You behold something, it changes you. So faith is a word we use to describe that relationship with God that transform us if, if we get to know him well. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. And what is the caveat to that, Gordon? We can't say that because Lucifer was right next to God. But well, we can't say the, re the better the relationship will be. We have That's to say correct. maybe. Maybe, yes. Because Lucifer, Lucifer was right next to God, knew him very well, and yet look how he turned out. Yeah. There was not a lack of, of perfection on the part of the message that God had. But you're still free to yep. choose the wrong path. Yep. So faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he's the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as long as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for seven, I'm sorry, the only requirement for heaven. And where is the verse that says that? Acts 16, 31. That's the passage where, he was to, where Paul, Paul, was ta Paul and Silas were talking to the Philippian jailer, what? Yeah, to the Philippian jailer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Faith also means, and this is where many people get left behind, that like Abraham, Genesis 18, and Job, Job 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, Exodus 32, 5 to 14, and Numbers 14, 11 and 25, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him, why? Wow. That's getting kind of personal, right? How dare we ask God why? Yeah. Didn't you but just? Yet, Abraham did, Moses mm -hmm. did, Job okay. did, as you, as you, as Dr. And, Maxwell said. And guess who in the Bible is called the friends of God? Those are three of the best. Yeah. Right there. Honestly, we can say that all true learning happens in the context of faith. The small child believes, that's another word for faith, what his parents teach him, whether or not it is true. Teachers have an impact on students because by one method or another they get their attention and convince them that what they have to say is important. That may be a challenging, a challenging uh, thing to do, but that's what their job is. Seventh-day Adventists have produced a book seeking to explain our most important beliefs. The very first fundamental belief that is mentioned talks about this issue. And this is from Seventh-day Adventists Believe, the third edition, 2018. The Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God, given by divine inspiration. The inspired authors spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
In his word, God has committed to humanity the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and the infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the definitive revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. Okay, very good. And there's a bunch of verses there. Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, John, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, Hebrews, and Peter, etc. There are many passages in Scripture that tell us that God's Word is, unreli is reliable. I'm sorry. Look at Psalm 19, 105, Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, John 17, 17, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, Hebrews 4, 12, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. So what difference does it make if we approach, it, appro I'm sorry, approach Scripture with an attitude of faith or an attitude of skepticism? We will find what we're looking for, <laughs> for good or ill. Mm-hmm. If we approach Scripture with an attitude of faith and or an attitude of skepticism, and let us not forget that the same one who inspired the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit, is needed to help us understand the scriptures as we read and study them. Margaret? In his word, God has committed to men the knowledge necessary for salvation. The holy scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. Yet the fact that God has revealed his will to men through his word has not rendered needless the continues, continued presence and guiding of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Savior to open the word to his servants, to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teaching of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that of the Word. This is Ellen G. White, Great Controversy uh, Introduction. Yeah. So, how do you see the role of the Holy Spirit in the giving of the, giving of the Bible and interpreting the Bible? He helps us to understand what we're reading. Well, first of all, he, had, he, he, he spoke or he revealed the things to the prophets, right? Yeah. And so then they struggled to put it down in, in the original language. And he helped them do that. And he helped them do that. And what happened next? It had to be copied. He helped mm -hmm. people copy. Although there were a lot of minor mistakes in the copying, that's no big deal. No, virtually none of those mistakes make any difference theologically. Um, and then... Ultimately, he helped get, 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 get it printed. He helped other people to translate it into various other languages. It's a whole sequence. I mean, think of all the things that happened from the time God chooses to inspire the prophet all the way down till, oh, here it is in my computer. I'm reading it now. Many, many steps, right? God has revealed himself. You not only have to read it, but you have to understand it. And hopefully it comes close to what God intended back at, at the beginning when he inspired the prophet. Yep. And it's a progressive, you know, we, we don't ever understand everything the first time through. We, every time you go through scripture, you find something else as your knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding of him grows. Well, God has revealed himself to us as human beings through dreams. Remember Daniel's dream in, in seven and, and all, and J Daniel two, he had a, he had a re repetition of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the statue. And then in Daniel 7, of course, we have the big beasts. And visions. Think of Abraham's vision from God. It says, get up, grab your family, and get out of here. And why did God say that to him? That was... That would be... Well, he wanted... Abraham. Abraham, he wanted to get him away from the culture, culture he that in. he lived in, had the pagan culture that he lived in. The influence of those people. Yeah. But and he went to a country, country that was full of pagan customs. But they weren't his family. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't tied to them close. Yeah. yeah. And God sometimes used signs. Can you think of an example? Or signs that Gideon? he gave to Gideon. Gideon's <laughs> what you remember from the Bible story. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. But he wasn't, uh, how many? Isaiah uh, yeah. and uh, who's the king? Hezekiah. The, the, the clock going back, yeah. Yeah. Well, here it refers to the story of Elijah up on the mountain. Do you think, how impressive was it when you, you watch those Baal worshippers dancing and cutting themselves and carrying on, and there's the sacrifice, there's the altar, there's the sacrifice, there's the wood, and hours go by, and you're watching them, and they're getting tired, and maybe other people come in, and, dance, and they're just trying to get the thing lit. They're just trying to get the fire started. They're sure, I'm, thought, I'm sure they figured somehow they were going to sneak fire and they are going to get it going. But of course, we believe that God would have prevented that if they tried it, which they probably did. And then, what did Elijah do? I mean, Elijah do? Put up the altar, put on the wood, put on the sacrifice, pour, pour it on the water, water four yeah. buckets full of water, kneel down, he says, okay, Lord, now it's your turn. Bam! Lightning strikes out of heaven. Ever since I was little, though, I keep wondering where did they get the water? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because it, just at the bottom of the hill, there's a stream that runs right into the Mediterranean, just a short distance to the Mediterranean. So they carried that up to the top of Mount Carmel. I presume. To do that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Most of the streams were dried up, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. It was a natural spring, I guess. Could have brought yeah. seawater up, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, might have been even seawater. Yeah. Well, is well, it that close to the Mediterranean Sea? It's pretty close. Is it? Yeah. Although, you know, probably not the distance so you could, you know, uh, well, it would take a while for someone to run down there and grab a bucket of water and come back up again. Uh, probably from the small stream that was down there at the bottom. But anyway, of course, the ultimate revelation is what? Jesus. He's the life and death of Jesus. If you begin looking at some commentaries, it is very clear that the parts of Scripture which speak most plainly about God's creative power and his ability to predict the future, which are clearly spelled out repeatedly and commented on in Isaiah 40 to 55, are the most important parts for understanding who is the true God. So, and God just says, that, okay, if you, you have other gods here, let them to predict the future. Let them create something out of nothing. I mean, that's a pretty fair test, right? Mm -hmm. And these parts are the ones, these parts that are attacked so viciously by critics. Uh, those would be what parts in the Bible especially? Creation. Creation. Yeah. The flood. Mm -hmm. And? The resurrection. Yeah, that too, but... And the miracles. Okay, miracles. that too. But where are the long-time predictions? Revelation, Daniel. Especially Daniel. Yeah. Oh, they just... If you read a, a, a non-Adventist commentary on the book of Daniel, <laughs> you just... You're shaking your head. You want to say a prayer of thanks for our insight. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, really. You do. So, uh, so what do you do? If here you have, either you take these critics' approach and you think, here I am reading this complete nonsense, as they would say it almost. I mean, I, I know commentaries, really known, scholarly known commentaries that say the, the, the miracle stories about Daniel in the lion's den and you know, the three words, he did the fire and what happened in the first two, three chapters of Daniel. Those are, those are stories kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk and, you know, and you're thinking, what? Mm -hmm. You know, and so how do you, why is it that some people can put it together as our Adventist pioneers did and we followed them and it all fits together so, so well and then there's other people that are doing Jack and the Beanstalk stuff. They're looking at them just like they're fables. Wow. You have ears to hear and or eyes parables to, see. to teach a lesson, maybe. Yeah. Spiritualizing away things. Yeah. Well, those books that, that really support the, the, the divinity of God are just attacked viciously. 
When all is said and done, of course, for many people, the only revelation of God will be through us. Do you as a Christian represent God correctly? Well, let's move on. Look at 1 Corinthians chapters 2, verses 9 and 10. So you weren't um, really asking us if we represented God correctly. You went right was, on to the next... I wasn't going to embarrass you by asking you to... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll say that I certainly don't uh -huh. all the time. Okay. Anybody, if you are, uh, you want to speak up? Well, I think the minute you think that you are, you really aren't. Yeah. Also, we come to Christ the more imperfect will yeah. oh. see ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Are there things in heaven that we have faint ideas about that just seem completely impossible. Paul goes on, but it was to you, it was to us that God made known his secret by means of his spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the hidden depths of God's purposes. Wow. God still has a lot of things to teach us, and he's preparing wonderful things for us in the world to come. This world is just, Ellen White says, just a we're in the, uh, probably in the kindergarten here, just barely getting started with some kind of real education about everything God has to say to us. Um, but now he makes his secrets known to us through his spirit, not all of them by, by any imagination. Do we allow the biblical authors to speak for themselves and for God without our doubting them? They clearly claim that their messages were not self-generated. So what if I stand up and say, Listen to me, I have a message from God. And you're going to say what? I'm going to say, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast, right? <laughs> wow. Jesus said that he who seeks to do the will of the Father will know the teaching, whether I speak of my own authority mm -hmm. or not. So mm -hmm. there is a sense in which we will know because we, uh, whether someone is speaking because we, uh, we are seeking to do the will of God. Our heart mm -hmm. is in the right place. Okay. If we say that one needs to approach the Bible with an attitude of faith, then why does it say in the Bible that our faith is built on the Bible? Isn't that a... It grows through the Bible. We're given a measure of faith. But, you remember uh, what Romans 1.16 says? From faith, from to, faith, faith. to faith. Mm -hmm. So you come and you say, okay, God, show me, tell me. And you read, oh, okay. And then it seems to build the faith. And you read some more and it builds faith more. And you, it just, it, yeah, from faith to faith. We recognize that it is hard to wrap our human minds around this idea, but we must recognize that the Bible is a divine human document. It is not just an ordinary book. Imagine if the Bible, as, as we have it, had been written by those same 40 authors over 1,500 years, just telling their own stories and what they thought about God down to the generations. Of what value would that be? Well, they could probably tell some very interesting stories. I don't think any of us would raise any questions about that. It would be of some value. Mm, yeah. But not as much. But we believe that behind every story and in every book we can see God. In order to understand the Bible correctly, we must allow the possibility. We don't have to start up with positive. You don't have to have 100% proof before you can start reading the Bible. But you at least have to have your mind open to the possibility that God is behind it all. Are we willing to accept that possibility? You out there, do you have a problem with that? If we choose to throw out some parts of Scripture, what are we doing? Judging it. Because we don't like what they say or we can't understand them, then we are placing ourselves above the Bible. We would be judging it instead of allowing it to judge us. Paul, writing 1 Thessalonians 2.13, 
says, and there is another reason why we always, always give thanks to God. When we brought you God's message, you heard it and accepted it, not as a message from human beings, but as God's message, which indeed it is. For God is at work in you who believe. Wow. God's message, he is at work in you who believe. Can we detect God's presence working <coughs> in our lives? Is that possible? I think so. Providential working. Ab mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Of course, we immediately recognize that God's highest and most explicit revelation was in the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. God has spoken repeatedly through the different parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament. When we see expressions like the word of the Lord, and when you see small caps, the word Lord in small caps, what does that mean? Yahweh. Yahweh. So that is a direct translation of the personal name of God. Okay, in the Don't Old you Testament. Mean large caps? No, it's 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 known as small caps. So that the if you look there, you see, even though they're capital letters, they're no taller. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Size. Yeah, the size. Sometimes it's, thus saith the Lord, or even words that the Lord spoke. Do these give us a clue to what kind of author was behind each writing? Mm -hmm. They should. Mm -hmm. So why do you think God chooses to represent himself through human thoughts and words? Couldn't his God... Ways, hmm? our, his ways are not our ways, so if he only did it from his perspective we wouldn't understand. Things have to be translated, like you were saying with languages, you know, it's, it's an imperfect process of mm -hmm. translating from one language to the other, but mm -hmm. that's why there's so many illustrations. Uh, like Jesus said, uh, what's the kingdom of God, heaven like? And he went on to tell many, many, many different ways the yeah. kingdom of heaven is like this, the mm -hmm. kingdom of heaven is like that trying yeah. to get us to understand from our limited perspective what, what uh, God's kingdom is all about. Okay, so why do you think God chooses to represent himself through human thoughts and words? Here's another idea. Tell me what you think about this. What if God should say, okay, I have a lot of angels, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm omnipresent myself, so I will give Dennis 15 minutes this, uh, every Sunday morning. And Margaret, you'll get another 15 minutes maybe on Monday. And that are you going to go around? Why not just have God, instead of working with this book and so forth, just have God actually sit down with us for a few minutes every week and make it very clear to us. What's wrong with that? Well, that be does, prayer life. <laughs> That's our prayer life. That's our prayer it life, okay? But to be fair, he would have to allow the devil to have direct oh personal contact with us for an equal amount of time. Otherwise, unless we are specifically asking for something else, he's and who is pinging his will. He's putting his will upon us. Who is it that's always complaining about not fair, no fairness? Satan. 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 He says, ah, you're not fair, not fair. But in a way, the struggle between the dark angels and the light angels is right here all the time yeah. with us in our mind. Yeah. Only through the words can we have access to thoughts. Thus, inspiration encompasses thoughts as well as the end product of those thoughts, that is, the written words of God. Next, Gordon. Uh, the next little is from the Adventist, uh, the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide uh, quotation from uh, Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology. Whether inspiration should be attributed to the inspired writings or to the scriptures, writers. inspired writers or to the scriptures written by them, is to a large extent a needless dilemma. It is clear that the primary locus of inspiration is in people. The Holy Spirit moved upon people to speak or write Yet what they spoke or wrote was the inspired word of God. Okay. So that's from another book and so forth. 
we have to be willing to accommodate ourselves to the idea that the Bible was not written, nor did Jesus live and die in our culture or in our time. We need to expand our thinking to try to understand and accept what were the norms and the ideas that moved people as they wrote the Bible or as they lived out their lives alongside Jesus. Can we do this? Jesus was a real human being, and we need to recognize that the life and death of Jesus was the focal point of Scripture. Of course, we look forward to his coming once again. I mean, they were looking for it first time, we're looking for it to come the second time. So ask yourself, where and how are you tempted not to follow the Bible because of personal experiences and feelings that draw you in a different direction? How do we choose between human influences that tend to draw us away versus influences from the Bible? I look at our world today and I think of cultural things, that massive cultural shifts in thinking that are moving us, the whole as a culture, away from the teachings of the Bible. And I wonder, you know, well, the, does this come from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the boastful pride of life? You know, is, is this what's drawing me in this direction? Or is it uh, the life of Christ? Yeah. His humiliation, his uh, submission to the Father. I'm sure that you all can think of times, stuff that's going on right now. Uh, in politics, for example, where lifestyles and other things like that are very different than what the Bible recommends. So ask yourself, where and how are you tempted to follow the Bible because of personal experiences and feelings that draw you in a di to, to not to follow the Bible because of personal experiences and feelings that draw you away in a different direction? And that question is for you out there more just as much as it is for us. What is it in our lives every day that you know, uh, I want to sit down and watch some crazy movie or, or some pro favorite program on television or whatever, instead of reading the Bible, instead of going out and witnessing to a neighbor about the truth, instead of all of the things. I mean, how much time do we, ta do we have during the week? How many hours? And how many of those hours are spent actually studying or sharing the biblical material? How are we supposed to gain an attitude of trust toward the Bible? Are we prepared to let God speak through his word? Are we willing to accept his ideas as better and superior to our own? Are you? Our kind and loving Father, we consider it a great privilege to be called your children, to recognize your presence among them, and we ask for your very special guidance as we continue to study these materials and share them with others so that they may, we all may be drawn nearer to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.